Hello, we are live with SCI TV. I'm Joshua Gordon, the founder of the Sports Conflict Institute, and I am joined by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Ken Pendleton. Ken, how are you today? I am doing pretty well. I'm happy to happy to be back after, uh, after as you know, Josh got married three weeks ago, and uh, you were there. <laughs> and uh, we've had a really nice, we had a nice homey moon, and next week we're going to go on a honeymoon. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that we can carve a little time out, and it was a wonderful wedding, and it's great to see you as happy as ever. I am. Thank you. Well, Ken, uh, often when we have these conversations, something big has happened in the world of sports, and really looking at it from our perspective, where we're trying to think fairly globally about what's going on. And last week, we had a major announcement by the NCAA on college basketball reform. So can you give us a little background on what precipitated this committee that made the recommendation and where we ended up a little bit and let's pull it apart from our lens. Sure, so it, it simply put, uh, la la last year, a bombshell story broke that the FBI had, was in fact, you know, investigating and presumably on the verge of arresting a number of, you know, coaches, as, you know, assistant coaches who were involved with using channels to get elite college basketball players substantial amounts of money right and and so this obviously goes against everything the ncaa stands for but it also seemed to speak to a larger issue which is that there's so there's so much money at stake in college basketball in general and for these players in particular that the ncaa is facing a huge challenge which is how are they supposed to you know how do they how are they supposed to regulate the, you know this you know the the marketplace for college basketball players and more to the point what can they possibly do to avoid effectively a black market where players are being paid under the table to to go to certain universities and get uh, get agents to get a foot in the front door for representing them when they embark on what are often nine figure nba careers and you have to imagine that this issue um is pretty complex and what was the timeline that they're trying to address this issue under yeah that i think that's that's right so in one level they had a they have a very complex issue which is going to involve lots of stakeholders which we're going to get back to in a second but they needed to because of the fact that the fbi was involved with this right this wasn't something that was just being handled in-house the in the fact that it had gone public it has a whole different specter the ncaa had promised and was un, under great pressure to deliver substantial reforms by this, the start of this college basketball season, which is really only a couple months away. And even right now, you could watch on ESPN Plus, I think, and you could watch Kentucky playing preseason games in the Bahamas. Right? So they, there was a real need to, to get something out there that said, here, it makes people feel like, wow, there isn't just gonna be a black market in players and we're gonna take significant action to try to regulate, you know, the, you know, the, you know how coaches and universities conduct themselves in a agents whatnot in terms of recruiting players and can uh, you know a lot of this commentary that's been happening in the last week has been really focusing specifically on the um changes that have been made and we can touch on them a little bit but let's back up a little bit and talk about what is this commission who is on this commission and that led to it because a lot of times the best way to understand the outcome is to look at the process that got us there I mean, and in, in theory, I have to say this, this was a a very a mostly very well rounded commission. That is, say it had it, it had Condoleezza Rice on it, who obviously has a lot of experience with both universities and government and, and other commissions heading it. It had past NCAA presidents. It had prominent basket former basketball coaches like John Robinson, athletic directors like Gene Smith at Ohio State approach like former players like David Robinson um, it, you know it, 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 it members of the various organizations that have a stake in American basketball outside the NCAA such as the NBA the AAU and USA basketball so for the and so for the most part you have to say this is you know this this is actually a really well composed group I say for the most part Albert because I think there's actually a really difficult issue about how how and whether the college players themselves are represented, and and what I mean by that is I think it, it, it's it's all, it's generally a really bad idea when a key stakeholder, and by the way, one that reaps the fewest immediate material benefits from the system, 
is not given explicit representation. So nothing against Mr. Robinson, and there might have been some other players. But what? But it, but Jalen Rose, for example, on ESPN was very critical and said they needed to find a way to have college basketball players involved. Here's the problem. That, that sounds really obvious on one level, but when you think about it, it's very hard to think about how that mechanism would work. There is no organization of college basketball players. It's hard to know how they would actually select who would represent them, who would be interested in representing them. How would that reflect their relationship with their coach in their university? And so I actually think there might be a, 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 a compromise idea here that would work well, which is to actually look for college athletes who have just recently graduated from college, maybe ones that don't even have NBA careers because they would be more, they would be the most in touch with this system and they might have a real motivation in time to get deeply involved in it, just throwing out that as an idea. So that was, that was, that, you know, that was uh, one, one, one really problematic issue. And I don't, I think it defies a simple answer. I think it would be very difficult to think about what NCAA college basketball players should we, you know, should we represent all of these basketball players and whether that's even really a good idea but it's clear, but on the other hand, I think it's clear that their voice needs to be heard here because you run the risk of having the group that's most directly implicated by all this. And then, like I said, has the least material benefit from the sport at present, actually feeling like, like, wait a second, once again, the system is just ignoring us completely and other people are making decisions about us. I come to your point too. You, you imagine that the temptation, especially with the time pressures, is to try and put a group of very knowledgeable people together who can move quickly to come up with some very tangible outcomes that you can roll out. And the NCA emphasizes in its press release that this is just the beginning of what they see as more fundamental reforms to come. And there are key stakeholders, even outside student athletes that weren't highly engaged like the NBA and the NBA Players Association and others who were engaged, but still want a deeper involvement because some of the reforms don't really go into their space in the way that they'd want to. When you look at the rosters of the working groups, and there are about eight working groups, most of them were pretty absent of student athlete voices. A few had them, some had none at all. And it, it really does illustrate that challenge that you're saying, which is you, you could see the NCAA's attempts to engage where they think they could, but what a, what a tough undertaking. As a student athlete, you'd have to understand this very, very complex system that you may only know it from one perspective, um, and can you make the time commitment and everything else is a, a real challenge. So your idea is a really nice nuanced one about how do you get someone who's very in touch with the issues from the student athlete perspective, but maybe has the capacity and time by being just outside of it. Right. And, and I think you're right in saying this problem couldn't be solved immediately, you know, given this, the understandable time constraint they had. But I think the NCAA might actually think about how can we get a system in place where we can identify athletes at different universities, maybe by conference or, you know, where they're nominated so that they could actually be, you know, they would be essentially put in a position where they were nominated by their peers, by their players while they were in college to be people they would say, we think you would do a good job representing our interests going forward, say, that for the next few, you know, say three or four years after you graduate from college. So you keep it fresh. And it'd be a novel approach, but I think you'd find some players, especially those who weren't looking for pro, you know, weren't quite good enough to have pro careers who would think this was a pretty great way to make a living. And they would be accounted in their, in the, in the peers would have a say in who they were, who were being selected. So I think they would feel good about that. So I think they're, I'm not saying I, that's the exact solution to be put in place, but I think there's some novel solve or original solve uh, problem solving that could be really helpful here. The other thing that could be really interesting, Ken, would be within these working groups, and it's possible that a few groups uh, relied on facilitators, but it's not part of, their named folks who were in the room when any of the work was happening. So I'm going to assume that they did not. And you can imagine that even when you're where you had one or two student athletes at the table out of about 20 folks who are working in the working group, the power dynamic is really challenging. And if you have an athletic director or a college president, uh, someone from a major apparel company who is at a very senior level, and then you have a student athlete, that's a really hard thing to even be able to influence the type of outcomes that come at that table, but a really skilled facilitator or neutral could help in making sure that all of those voices are, are heard and they come out as part of the type of solution generation that they're working on. Well, well let's drill down in one of the cases, not to say what we think should be done in this case, but to highlight one of the, what seems to be the most salient disconnect that occurred in this meeting. So the 
USA Basketball, as we mentioned, had a representative. I believe you correct me if I'm wrong. His name is Martin Dempsey. And um, part of the what the committee concluded was that the, the top players who were entering their senior year of high school could get formal legal agent representation beginning on July 1st of their senior year. Okay, so in how are they how are they going to select those elite players? Well, they said that USA Basketball was going to make that decision. Now, there's just one problem with that. The stories that have been that, you know, that I've read indicate that USA Basketball felt quote blindsided by this, and so there's a there's a disconnect for me. How how could Martin Dempsey be on the committee on the one hand as a member of USA Basketball, yet they were blindsided by the idea that they were going to have responsibility, which all initial indications are they don't want for identifying say the 15 top prospects. And who are seniors in high school every year. Right? And so if you had had a, 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 a facilitator who was not, was not a stakeholder, they might have, they, they, I think they would have been more likely to say, here's the people who should be in this meeting. Here's what we need to get as a, if we're going to move forward with this proposal, here's what this entails for the different institutions who are represented in this meeting. Are you guys on board? Are you guys all on board with this? Right. But yet somehow, despite all the undoubted expertise in this meeting, they, they, they apparently you know, had a member, in spite of the fact that the, the relevant body was represented or the body they want to actually do this really important work was represented, that organization was caught completely unaware and, and, and apparently doesn't even want to be involved in instituting the suggestion. So you have a, what Mike Krzyzewski called a breakdown in execution. And so that I think there should be some soul searching about what went wrong with the process there. But I think I suspect you're right in saying that a neutral facilitator for all these subgroups and even for the larger group could be incredibly helpful in terms of minimizing those problems. Yeah, a huge red flag for me is whenever something rolled out already starts to have strands that unravel within the first week or two of when it's announced from key stakeholders. And that's really a lot of what you're saying is that some of the key stakeholders who were formally involved and engaged in this process we're still raising some concerns after implementation or after it's it's being announced. And the the question that comes out of that is, and this is a really challenging thing for any work group and those of us who work on complex problem solving can't emphasize it enough, which is try and break it yourselves. Right. So whatever solutions you come up with, don't don't get too quick about wanting to roll it out. Try and break it. Bring in all your worst critics right into the room from the outside. Put them at the table. Get your stakeholders who are going to be most concerned and see if you can break it. Because it's much better to break it there than have the media spending their time breaking it with those same stakeholders on air and, and eroding some of the trust. As you and I were discussing even off air, there's a lot of really good work that came out of this. And yet, if you read the, the, the media take on it, there's a lot of criticism being directed towards the NCAA, even though that this may very well be substantively incredibly good steps in the right direction. And usually if your substance is pretty good and your PR was handled pretty well, which it was, and yet there's still criticism, you have to question whether or not the process and stakeholders are creating the durability in what you're doing. Yeah, yeah no, I think in this case, the way I would think of it is there are problems that are unavoidable that you're going to get, they were going to bound to get criticized by some groups for not going far enough and by some conservative groups for going too far. That's just inevitable. What you want, what you want to avoid though, or what Mike Krzyzewski called questions about execution, right? You want to make sure at least as much as you could possibly do it here, that all the stakeholders in that meeting who, you know, who were included actually came out of it and were on the same page about how we were going to, you know, what the plan was and how we were going to execute it. And that means, you know, the, you, you, given the time constraints, that meant you could cast as wide as net as you might like to get criticism, but you could have at least really tried to make sure, like, wait a second, this implicates your org this implicates USA Basketball. We really need to know where you're at on this, Mr. Dempsey, and do you need to reach out to other people in your organization in an expedited fashion to find out where they're at on this? I don't see it as an insurmountable problem, by the way. There's got to be some. You know, there's some way I might think, you know, I might like it might be agents who are best, for example, to to identify the most promising prospects <laughs> or NBA scouts, whatever it is. There, not, there probably isn't an answer here. So that's why it's sort of strange that you would end up 
offering an answer that the, that the body that, the, that you wanted to make responsible for it wanted no part of. So can the NCA in their press release they have a, a fairly broad statement that says change doesn't end here? And they name a number of stakeholders, including the NBA and the NBA Players Association, apparel companies, and the USA Basketball as needing to be more involved uh, in conversations going forward and and then kind of committing to even if those entities don't get involved to continue to pursue changes on behalf of student athletes so i ask you uh where are we headed uh, from here yeah i think in the big picture this is i, I, I and I, I want to credit andy staples of sports illustrated for a piece he wrote on this that i, I think that, like i said before they're going to be people who are going to say it went too far and people say it didn't nearly go far enough and i think andy staples is right in saying this was this ultimately is a step in the right direction because what we we've seen the athlete rights have gone have increased appreciably over the last 10 years it was inconceivable before for example that you would have a cost of living stipend or any kind of stipend for student athletes and now that's taken that's that's somewhat taken for granted baseball and, ho and hockey which are non-revenue sports have gone from allowing quote advisors to allowing full-on agents the last couple of years and 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 so you're seeing you're seeing basketball do this and i imagine at some point you're going to see football doing it so you're seeing a, a kind of evolution but and even a bigger picture the ncaa is gradually becoming less paternalistic and let me give you one really dramatic example if you went back 40 years ago when abc had a monopoly on college football they wanted to have Fran Tarkenton be the color commentator, and the NCAA vetoed it because they thought he was too associated with pro football. Never mind that he had been an All-American quarterback at Georgia and had a really nice college career. They nonetheless thought, like, no, no, he's accomplished too much as a pro quarterback, so we don't want him. We think it, it hurts our brain. But what I want to get at isn't whether they were right or wrong about that. Is the point they were actually going against ABC, which was at that time had a monopoly on broadcasting college football and said, no, if you're going to handle our sport, you got to do it this way. And what you're gradually seeing is a re is a realization, like you could see in that closing statement by that committee in you know, Mrs. Rice's committee, that they're recognizing that the best results aren't coming by us deciding in, you know, among you know, what should be done. It's by actually bringing in the relevant parties you know, maybe ABC actually knows who would be a better color commentator. They're in the business of broadcasting college football, right? And maybe, you know, maybe USA Basketball has good reasons for not wanting to, to be ones responsible for this. Maybe the NBA and the NBA PA have to be consulted if you're going to have age restrictions that are going to that are going to work for both you know, in a way that harmonizes the interests of both the college and the pro game. And so I think you're seeing a receptivity for that that is is, is unprecedented in and I and so I, I actually feel like the NCAA here is I give them a, a fairly high grade under the under considering the incredible nature of the allegations that occurred in that last year, coupled with the the exigency of the need to come out with something, you know, rel in in relatively short time by the standards of huge institutions. And I and I actually do think they're they're they're, they're learning to evolve and work with all the stakeholders to make changes in a way they. They never were when I was a child when I was growing up watching college sports. And certainly the threats of the status quo are not going to stop. We, we are going to continue to see a number of lawsuits going through the pipeline that will destabilize the current system and will likely threaten a number of areas that we take for granted as part of the NCAA model. And they're going to have to continue to evolve and adapt. So this ability that you and I are highlighting to mobilize stakeholders, to engage stakeholders, to work to um, come up with solutions that are durable and try and break them themselves before they roll them out, to be proactive in these are all really important steps in their evolution from where they were even several years ago when we've had similar conversations about um, the NCAA being in some crisis moment. This seems like a, a really uh, positive step towards a much more methodical and appropriate process-oriented approach. And I agreed, and they're going to need to be even more expansive because, as you as you mentioned, the challenges that are coming, you know, are going to get much bigger. And I think the one everybody's waiting for is how this the Jeffrey Kessler lawsuit 
comes out and he's basically arguing college athletes should be treated as employees and have the same rights. And if that, you know, judging whether that, leaving aside whether that's the right or wrong decision, if that decision is actually held up, you know, is, is by the courts, the NCAA is going to have to learn to engage with student athletes and agents in marketing in marketing groups in a way that they've never engaged before. So they, I think they're slowly learning to actually realize that this is going to have to be a shared enterprise in a way that was that would have been unimaginable in, in past decades. Yeah, certainly the agenda for this committee was a lot, and yet it probably represents a very, very small percentage of the types of reforms are going to have to continue to evolve through. Yeah, com completely agree. So it was going to be a very interesting evolving story going forward. Well, kind of pleasure as always. Thank you so much for taking time to pull this apart and offer a unique perspective on what's going on in our world of sports and sports biz. Well, thank you, Josh. Nick. Can't wait till we do our next episode. Sounds great. Me too.